He was nothing like I'd imagined a police detective to be. He wasn't menacing or threatening, and he was sweating profusely. Every time I saw him, he had a bag of peanuts in his hand, and he ate them one at a time. He wasn't unfriendly or intimidating, but he was hard to get along with. Mr. Frommeth, we can't let you go until tomorrow morning. We don't have anyone to do paperwork on Sunday night. Samuel Green tried to be professional and friendly at the same time. It didn't work. I'd been in the holding cell for three days, and now he was telling me I had to stay another night. The whole thing was weird. First of all, I shouldn't have been here in the first place. I guess they couldn't wait to pin a murder on someone. Unfortunately, I wasn't good enough for them. All I could do was look across the table at him and shrug. Hell, I didn't really want to get out of here anyway. I was disappointed when they told me I wouldn't be charged. Those bastards were sending me home. I was being returned to my wife and my family. Back? Back? No bail, no refunds. I felt like an old soda bottle. The good news is you can order your own dinner tonight from stakeout. Now the money comes from a different fund. You can order whatever you like. I smiled weakly at him. Sam, will you be here in the morning? Uh, sure. Why would you know that? Well, I was hoping you could help me out a little with this release. What do you mean? Well, I'll be completely free, right? Yeah, no strings attached. Is there any way you can let me go without turning me over to my family? When Sam Green laughed, sweat beaded on his forehead. You mean you want to sneak out the back door? After I nodded, he shook his head. She really hurt you, didn't she? I nodded again. I'll tell you what, John. You think about what you want, and I'll figure out how to help you get it. Will that be okay? That night, I had a chicken dinner and was the envy of all my cellmates. After eating apple pie, I spent the rest of the evening going over everything that had happened in my head and trying to plan my future. My head seemed to be working fine, but I had no idea what my plans would be. I was working at the Northeast Regional Ace Equipment Distribution Center. I spent my entire day loading and unloading trucks. It wasn't very challenging, but I enjoyed it and the pay was adequate. I provided for my family and raised two fine boys on that paycheck. Todd was 16 and Jeremy was a year younger. My marriage and my life were great until three days ago when I was arrested. The arrest was fairly simple, but when I learned the circumstances surrounding the arrest, things got more complicated. In fact, I made them complicated on purpose. However, that was not my intention at the time. I was in the warehouse doing my regular job at my regular shift time when the police arrived. My supervisor pointed me out and I was immediately handcuffed and taken to the black and white room. All of this was in front of my co-workers at work. By the time I got to the patrol car, everyone in the building was aware of what was happening. Of course, I had no idea what had happened. Being a law-abiding citizen, I followed orders like a little puppy and didn't ask any questions. That's when I first met Sam Green. At first, he was a little stern, telling me all the way out not to do anything stupid. By the end of the day, his demeanor began to change. After the formal introductory part of the interrogation confirming my identity, things started to get interesting. Sam Green was very interested in where I had been all morning. He didn't seem happy when I assured him that 15 people could confirm that I had never left the warehouse. I tried to be polite and accommodating until he dropped a bombshell on me. Do you know a man named Thomas Esterly? Well, he's not a close friend of mine, but I know him. What does that have to do with him? He was killed this morning at 11 o'clock in a hotel parking lot. His car exploded. Why am I being questioned about what happened to Thomas Esterly? I haven't seen the guy in over 15 years. What was your relationship with Mr. Esterly? Uh, none. He was an old friend of my wife's before I met her. I met him a few times, but never for personal reasons. What was the relationship between Mr. Esterly and your wife? Detective Green, you're starting to piss me off. Laura and Tom Esterly were a couple for several years. I met her about six months after they broke up. I never asked her about her relationship with him. I suggest you talk to her. We've already done that, Mr. Frommeth. We spoke to her two hours ago today. Why? Your wife was with Mr. Esterly just before he was killed. She was at the crime scene when we arrived. Suddenly, I didn't like the way the conversation was going. I had a good marriage. My life was perfect. Laura had never given me a reason to think otherwise. Of course, that could have been my fault because I wasn't looking for anything. It was because I never suspected anything. Tic-tac. Tick tock My brain was finally working, and I didn't like the conclusions I'd come to. 
Since I didn't respond, he spoke again. The hotel security cameras show Mr. Esterly and your wife entering room 311 at 945 and leaving there at 1230. Your wife returned to her car, and Mr. Esterly returned to his car. When Mr. Esterly tried to start his Mercedes, it exploded. Your wife was far enough away that she wasn't hurt. Can I get a cup of coffee? He seemed a little annoyed by my request. I interrupted his stream of concentration. I needed a short break to clear my head. I had just found out that my wife, with whom I had spent 18 years, had been unfaithful. My whole life was built around her and the children she and I had. Everything was falling apart. No, I didn't kill Thomas Esterly, but I really wish I had. The rest of his questions would have been unnecessary. Sam Green left the room for a moment and returned with cups of black coffee from the machine. He was shitty, but I needed time to think, so I sipped it for a while. Detective Green, can I assume my wife confirmed all of this information or did she have some alternative explanation? No, Mr. Frommuth, there was no other explanation. We showed her the evidence and she cooperated with us. She met Mr. Esterly and they did spend over two hours together in room 311. I know this is not part of your investigation, but was that the first time they met or had they been together before that? Mrs. Frommuth indicated that she and Mr. Esterly met every month for at least three years. She had no idea who would want Mr. Esterly dead. Now do you see why you're our prime suspect? I finished my coffee in one final gulp. My body seemed to shudder at the bitterness of it. It suited my mood at the moment. Why did she have to come clean about all of this? Honestly, I think she was scared to death. Turns out they usually arrived in the same car. Today she had some shopping to do, so she decided to meet him there. If they'd followed their usual routine, your wife would be dead too. I think she knew that. Well, I guess I better tell you everything so you can finish this. What do you mean? It was me. I parked my truck in the back of the warehouse and slipped out without anyone seeing me. I put the bomb under Esterly's car, and then I went back to work. I was gone less than 30 minutes, so no one even missed me. Would you be willing to sign a statement acknowledging that? Sure. An hour later, I was put in my own cell. Most of the other detainees had to share a cell, but murderers were given separate cells. So why would I do something so stupid? It was simple, really. I was a quiet guy, but I was proud. How I treated myself was important to me. Of course, that meant that how other people treated me was also important to me. This situation changed everything in the blink of an eye. It was now obvious to me that my wife had little respect for me. I believed Detective Green when he said that Laura had been having an affair with Thomas Esterly for three years. Not because of any information I had, but simply because there was no way she would make something like that up and neither would he. Not only did I not want to live with her anymore, I didn't even want to see her. I was sure she would have a logical explanation for everything, but I didn't want to hear it. The best way to avoid her was to go to jail. My relationship with my two sons had always been great. I never did anything to embarrass them or make them feel like I wasn't a great father. Right now, I didn't feel like a great father. I was a cuckold. My wife, their mother, openly admitted to sleeping with another man. There was no way that information would not get out to them. I realized I couldn't look at my sons and hold my head high after everything happened. She humiliated me in front of my boys. She took away my manhood in front of my children. How could I face them without feeling like I had failed them? My best plan of action was to announce to the world that when I found out what was happening, I took action to stop it. I killed the son of a bitch who ruined my marriage. That way, my sons could at least be a little proud of how their father handled the situation. In fact, I wish I had actually done it. It was better than nothing. Anyway, right now, I didn't want to meet my sons any more than I wanted to meet my wife. There was no way I could get back to work. I played cards and bowled with all the guys. If they knew that my wife had been cheating on me for three years, I would never get over it. The humiliation I would have to endure would be more than I could bear. So there was no way I could go back to Ace Nardwari. The situation with my family would be exactly the same. I didn't want to run into any of them. There was no explanation for what Laura had done to me that wouldn't make me look weak. My only hope was to go to prison and forget them all. The plan was to avoid a trial by signing a plea bargain. If you believe the movies and TV, they always offer you a plea to that 
to save the expense and trouble of a trial. All I had to do now was wait for the arraignment. I didn't care what happened to me, but I refused to stand there and face a bunch of people I knew and look like a cuckold loser. One of the nicest things about my incarceration was that I could refuse visitors. I was more or less forced to talk to the public defender who was assigned to me, but I refused to see my wife or my brother Will. Except for my attorney, I spent most of Friday alone. They gave me a newspaper, and articles about the murder of Thomas Esterly were everywhere. I was named as the alleged killer, and Laura was loudly proclaimed the Holiday Inn whore. My sons must be so proud of me. It turned out that Esterly had made a small fortune in the real estate market and had also married well. Sam Green came by after dinner. John, I have one quick question and then I'll let you go. Where did you get the black powder you used to make the bomb? There was a gun show at the Lancaster Fair last summer. I bought two cans there, but I didn't have a receipt. I realized something was wrong as soon as I answered him. He had a big smile on his face as he walked out of the chamber. I'm not sure, but I thought I saw him wink. I thought the answer was pretty good because the boys and I did go to that gun show. Saturday started out boring. After lunch, two guys from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Administration in Washington showed up. I didn't like them and refused to talk to them without my attorney present. It was a weekend, and they couldn't find my public defender anywhere. They left after a few hours, but didn't seem too sad. The rest of the day passed without incident, except for a very brief visit from Sam Green. He just stopped by and asked me if I was okay. I nodded affirmatively. He smiled again and left. Sunday afternoon, Sam came back and we spent some time together. That's when everything fell apart. John. It took us a couple days, but eventually we put the pieces back together. I didn't like the way you tried to mislead us, but I understand why you did it. I sat quietly, waiting for him to say something else. The ATF guys were able to find out all about the bomb that killed Thomas Esterly. They were even able to identify the guy who probably built the bomb, and they were right. It was C4 John, not Black Powder. Last night, they picked up the professional bomber who made the bomb named Frank Donato in Philadelphia. Phone records indicated that he had contacted Sylvia Esterly, Tom's wife, 13 times in the last few weeks. Sylvia Esterly withdrew $25,000 from her bank account last Wednesday. She refused to say what she did with it. Well, that pretty much ruined my plan. I sat and listened for the next hour as Sam Green described everything that had happened. Laura would be a collateral victim. Sylvia Esterly would be happy to have Laura in the car with her husband. And then it was over. I waited for Monday so I could be released. No bail and no refunds. That damned phrase echoed in my head like an Amy Winehouse song. Prison time would have left me with some dignity. Now I had none. I was being released to a cheating wife two sons who I was sure had completely lost respect for me, and a job I would be too embarrassed to return to. I could no longer make eye contact with my family or friends. The saddest part was that I had nothing to do with any of this. I was a victim, with no collateral and no return. What the hell did that even mean? Sam was a man of his word. I could see Laura, Todd, and Jeremy in the lobby when I checked out. Sam took me aside and we walked out the entrance to the parking garage. He waited for the banks to open so I could get some cash. I kept what was in the checking account, but took the $22,000 we were saving for a new house. Then my new detective buddy drove to the Ace Warehouse so I could pick up my truck. Sam and I shook hands. I had my truck and some bucks. I decided there was nothing in the house that I couldn't live without. He came back to meet my wife and kids as I drove south on the highway. My first stop was in Knoxville. After a nice dinner and a cold beer, I turned on my cell phone. I had 13 messages from Laura, which I deleted and then called Todd. Dad, is that you? Where the hell are you? I'm fine. Are you alone right now? Can you talk? Yeah, mom's in the bedroom. She's been in there all day. Jeremy's here with me. I'm sorry, son, but after what happened, I just couldn't bring myself to come home. I hate to part with you guys, but you're both pretty mature and I think you'll get over it. We're doing fine, Dad. Mom looks like a wreck, but she doesn't get much sympathy from anyone, including us. You guys are going to have to take care of everything for a couple years. I'll send some money as soon as I can. We talked for a few more minutes. Things with my sons were not as bad as I expected. They seemed to be on my side, even though I had run away. That night I slept better than I expected. 
By noon the next day, I was in Huntsville. I rented a small trailer and got a job at a warehouse through an agency the next day. By the end of the next week, I was offered a permanent job. I was overqualified and underpaid, but it seemed like a steady job and the future prospects looked good. I was getting ready to start sending money home for the boys. All that changed when Todd called. Todd and Jeremy had moved out of our house and were now living with my parents. Jeremy and Laura started fighting. It ended with Jeremy getting slapped several times by his mother. He defended himself, but he didn't hit her back. Todd was very careful to explain that it wasn't Laura's fault in any way. Laura tried to convince the boys that what she had done was somewhat justified. Todd tried his best to keep his cool, but Jeremy exploded. He seemed to call his mother every name I could think of. Eventually, it got to the point where Laura couldn't take it anymore. In a fit of rage, Laura screamed that they should have just left with her spineless father. Todd and Jeremy moved out the next morning. Two days later, my father arrived in Huntsville with my two sons. I had no problem trading my small trailer for a larger one. Dad stayed for a couple days and then came home. Todd had the presence of mind to get their high school diplomas before they left, so there was no problem getting them to start living near each other. The biggest challenge was getting the two of them to decide what kind of car they were going to buy. I think Todd won because Jeremy didn't have his license yet. We haven't heard from Laura. She never contacted my parents either. Over the next year, I got two good promotions with pay raises. We moved out of the trailer and into a small rented house. Todd had a girlfriend and a part-time job. Jeremy had a driver's license and a car on Jack's in the backyard. We shared household chores, but I was stuck on cooking. I was at work when I received the divorce papers. I never got an explanation or apology. I really didn't want that. I would love to tell you what horrible things happened to Laura, but I can't. She was out of my life and I wasn't going to let her back in. I'm sure she's sitting in a comfy chair or bar stool somewhere wishing me well. Just thinking about it brings a smile to my face. I'm sorry, Laura. You've lost. No deposit, no refund. 